Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad you all can make it to this uh, very special seminar in the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. To learn more about the research we're doing, please visit our website. We have uh, many webinars on our YouTube channel and um, also uh, suggest that you follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, but today's seminar, um, as I mentioned, is, is quite special. It's the um, Bob Schechter Award Seminar. So the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment has decide to, decided to honor the late Bob Schechter for his lifetime commitment to higher education and research by establishing a research award in his name. So unfortunately, I never uh, met or worked with Bob, but I've heard absolutely wonderful things um, he was the intellectual soul of both the petroleum and chemical engineering departments at the University of Texas at Austin. He was one of the great professors of our lifetime. Bob was a professor at UT Austin for more than 30 years. During this time, he was chairman of both the chemical and petroleum engineering departments. He was also one of the first National Academy of Engineers elected at UT. Above all, Bob was a mentor, friend, and inspiration to many petroleum and chemical engineering students and faculty. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have uh, some of Bob's family, including um, his nephew, David, here with us today, who's a, also a successful petroleum engineering faculty. Um, I'll bet at that other school down the road. So if we have created an endowed annual research award in his name, the R.S. Schechter Research award will go to anyone who's made substantial contributions to science and technology of energy production. And this year's uh, award winner is, of course, uh, Dr. Steve Bryant. So as the University of Calgary's first Canada Excellence Research Chair in Materials Engineering for Unconventional Oil Reservoirs at the University of Calgary, Steve Bryant has brought together advances in nanotechnology, novel materials, and microbiology to reimagine how society can benefit from hydrocarbon resources with reduced environmental impact. Discoveries from this work have produced 20 invention disclosures in five startup companies in the last five years alone. He continues this research in his current role in the uh, School of Engineering Research Chair in Materials Engineering, while also leading the development of strategies for transdisciplinary studies and for engagement of students and faculty in research aimed at innovation. Previously, he held the Bank of America Centennial Chair in the Department of Petroleum Geosystems Engineering here at the University of Texas at Austin, where he directed the Geological Geo2 Storage Joint Industry Project and the Nanoparticles for Subsurface en Engineering Industrial Affiliates Program. You know, and I'll say personally, Steve was a, um, very much a mentor to me in the time that he was here. He worked in industry research centers in Europe for a decade before joining academia. Dr. Bryan has published more than 400 articles in production and reservoir engineering, formation evaluation, and CO2 storage, and has trained 150 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. He serves as the chief scientist for two sites of the Creative Destruction Lab, providing mentorship of ventures seeking to commercialize innovations in climate and energy. Dr. Bryan is the proud recipient of the 2021 SBE Sustainability and Stewardship Award in the oil and gas industry. He earned his BE from Vanderbilt University and PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, both in chemical engineering. And if I'm not mistaken, your supervisor was Dr. Bob Schechter along with Dr. Larry Lake. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Steve Bryant and present him the award. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> Come here, photo walk. <laughs> Thanks for that kind introduction. Thank you all for coming to hear this. And uh, as, as Matt pointed out, uh, there's, there's the title. Uh, everything he said about Professor Schechter is exactly right, and I had the great good fortune to be personally 
involved with Professor Schechter. Uh, and, you know, for, I knew him for more than 30 years, uh, originally as a graduate student, uh, which was a tremendous opportunity uh, to, to, to sit at the feet of a master. <laughs> and one of the things that, uh, one of the most abiding things that, that I learned from him and got reinforced by working with Professor Lake, who's also here, um, he taught me the definition of what he called an interesting problem. And any of you remember Schechter and Cl it wasn't, he didn't turn to the board and write down the definition. You had to infer it from realizing what he was talking to or referring to when he would say things like, now Bryant, that's an interesting problem. And you could hear the capital letters when he said it. And it wasn't my name, it was in capital letters. It was the interesting problem. So figuring out what that is and how, how to approach it, uh, we, we could have a seminar on that. Um, but the key point uh, had to do with, with recognizing uh, implications, thinking about what you were doing, uh, and so forth. Okay, so there's a theme here. Years later, after I graduated, occasionally I had the occasion to, to come by UT. I would stop in and say hello. He'd ask after uh, my family. And then very quickly, he would say, are you working on anything interesting? And it was my abiding ambition to be able to say yes to that. Years later, he's retired. Uh, Professor Lake and I were both here as faculty. And uh, we would periodically invite ourselves to his house to help him drink his scotch and have various philosophical conversations. But inevitably, what came up was a discussion of something interesting with a capital I, often something that he was working on. So it's not a surprise that that quote that you see uh, on the screen uh, was you know, arose in, in a study that he did of great discoveries in science. And he had this common theme, hmm, that's interesting. And he traces how this arose, often serendipitously, throughout a number of important discoveries. So for the scientific basis for this is, is, is one thing. I think he would be interested also in another way to look at this. And I'll frame it like this, because it kind of tees up what we'll talk about. Uh, it is a fairly remarkable thing, and it's not just in recent times, that um, a group of people, it only takes two, but it could be three or 20 or 1,000, it only takes a small group of people who can look at exactly the same set of observations, same data, right in front of them, and come up with diametrically incompatible conclusions about the, the data. And in the modern world, what that usually leads to is the following discussion. You're wrong. No, you're wrong. No, you're both wrong. And you get the idea. I think there's another way to look at it. There's one that I think Bob might have uh, appreciated, um, which is to ask it this way. In what way are you all correct? And that would be an interesting way to look at things. So, so we'll, we'll address that in several forms as we go through this. Okay, so this is about, I should go back. I thought about, I thought hard about the title. I figured if I said the case for utter despair, uh, the audience would be a lot smaller, okay? But this wasn't just a bait and switch. There is indeed, I think, cause for optimism, and we'll see if you agree with me uh, when we're done here. So there's, there's the program, uh, a brief prologue, a play in three acts, and an important coda. And so to begin with the prologue, net zero is a collection of things that we need to do as a society, as a civilization, to reduce emissions, primarily CO2, that's what this chart is. That's the, uh, the, the net zero emissions pathway that the International Energy Agency published last fall. Uh, and the point of that is you see the green curve uh, coming down from north of 30 gigatons a year down to zero. Um, and you do this in several ways. You can eliminate emissions, for example, by replacing internal combustion engines with uh, electric vehicles. You can avoid emissions by capturing CO2 from existing uh, CO2 emitting fossil fuel burning uh, uh, industrial processes. And importantly, there's a new kid on the block. It is now clear that we will also have to uh, remove CO2 from the atmosphere, so-called negative emissions. So direct air capture of CO2 is one example of that. Uh, we'll need all of those things to get to net zero. 
But if that was it, I would be talking about something else today. Here's some exciting graphics. The key point is, and this is important, 2050, that is now 28 years away. If that number was 2100 or some such time, this would not be difficult. It's the time scale that makes this a challenge, okay? So that's a key point and something that we will be, uh, that drives a lot of the conversation and that's been, that's part of the big challenge here, okay? That's why I went to a great deal of time and effort to figure out something that, you wanna see that again? Watch. 2050, it's sooner than you think. Okay, even for old people like me, it's not that far away. For you younger generation, for sure, this is, this is particularly relevant, okay? So act one, simple answers, please. So here, the data are familiar by now. Blue line is, is average temperature increasing. This is the last 150 years or so. A black line is CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Green line is uh, CO2 emissions and they're all going up, and so something needs to change, okay? But it's complicated. How many of you have seen Sankey diagrams before? Anybody? A few? Oh, good, but not everybody? Do you love these or hate these? Only an engineer could love something like this. And you, you could spend a lot of time following around all the things that are going on there and connections here and back and forth and around and around. It's complicated, and so we don't like complexity. Humans like to simplify things, and this is what a lot of the conversation is about these days. Faced with the need to do something, something big, in a complicated system, can I boil this down to simpler prescriptions? So uh, there's mainly in the, in, the, in the space I live in and in the things I hear, it pretty much boils down to three groups of people, and you see them there. There's doomers, there's cheerleaders, and there's shruggers, okay? Should hold up a poll here. Which one do you think you are? Um, but we'll, we'll come to that and see later. Uh, all right, doomers. This is characteristic of the, of the doomer approach. The key things there are underlined for you. Crisis, loss, failure, collapse, extinction, out of time. Okay, so their prescription, as that banner hung from a bridge over the River Thames indicates, their, one of their main prescriptions is in fossil fuels now. Okay. Others see the same data we had on the previous slide, and they find cause for optimism, even for cheerleading, uh, and invest, you know, essentially a key message is we can do this, we can build renewable energy, and that will get us out of this, out of this impending mess. There's another class of cheerleaders, and this is an important class, so I didn't come up with another name for them, but you will have seen this kind of stuff as well. A, the number in front of trillion varies depending on which magazine you read, but that's the order of magnitude. This extraordinarily large investment opportunity in the climate transformation. So invest in things that didn't exist not very long ago, uh, the clean tech sector, green bonds, carbon offsets, and there's many more, okay? There's an opportunity here. So that's, that's, a, that's a cheerleading message. There's another category called, I call it shruggers, who, there's various flavors of sugar, it's not my problem. It's important, but it's not that important. Uh, it's too big, you know, I can't, I can't get my mind around this. And so they have a, well, let's see, if you've seen these kinds of things. Uh, that, that graph on the left is a Pew uh, poll. These are pre-pandemic uh, uh, evaluations, so the ranking might be different now, but. You ask a, a bunch of Americans, and they concluded that on this league table, climate change was the fifth most important uh, challenge facing uh, the world. Uh, and then there's these kinds of things people have fun with. This is coming from the Cato Institute, that plot on the right. So the first set of bars here, if you pay, would you be willing to pay, I should have asked you this before I showed you this, would you be willing to pay one more dollar on your electric bill each month to combat climate change? About half of Americans this time said yes. As soon as that number got bigger, $10 to $100, the proportion willing to pay went down in a hurry. So it's important, but it's not so important that you would spend a significant amount of money on it. Uh, so the answer, the, so I'm summarizing their prescription is we'll just change the channel, okay? There's other ways to uh, spend your time than worrying. So let me summarize this. So who's right? 
everybody. How can that be? The doomers are right. It is humans. This is anthropogenic. Okay? The cheater leaders are correct. We definitely need to be building renewables. I agree with that. I think most people do. The, the, the investment cheerleaders are right. It's the global energy system, that requires a lot of capital to be deployed. The shruggers are right, it's hard. Okay, especially by when? 2050. Okay, you hear different dates out there, but any way you cut it, it's, it's, it's soon, okay? So there's their prescription summarized. Okay, so we set the scene in Act One. I chose this title, Driving into the Future. Why driving? The biggest challenge in decarbonization, in many respects, is transportation. So that inner circle is uh, the, the pie chart of emissions in 2010, the outer circle is 2019, again, the pre-pandemic values. The sector that's growing the fastest is transportation and is now the second largest source uh, of emissions. The other ones I didn't want to label because I don't want you to be distracted yet, but the transportation is hard because transportation in the modern world means oil. And decarbonizing oil is an interesting challenge, okay? So applying these prescriptions from the various groups to, uh, to, to transportation has some interesting results. So I'll should, let's look at them. So if we narrow down their prescriptions, stop fossil fuels now, okay, stop oil. That's one of the fossil fuels. Uh, for renewables, to displace oil, we need electric vehicles. To run electric vehicles, we need the green power capacity. So each one of these things for the top three, you know, just aligns with what they were saying. The shruggers are going to carry on doing what they're doing uh, until something, something, something that get, catches their eye becomes available, okay? So let's apply these things. Stop oil now. We have seen this movie before, twice. To reduce emissions from fossil fuels to zero requires an 8% reduction every year between now and 2050, 8%, okay? We've seen 8% reduction of fossil fuel consumption twice in the last 100, well, in human history as far as I know, but certainly in the last 150 years. On the left, that was the Great Depression, 8 to 9% reduction every year for three years. It was not pretty. On the right, I don't know if you can see, you probably can see that date. Uh, that's uh, Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street in Manhattan during the lockdown. It doesn't normally look like that, okay? So during, the pan, during 2020, oil consumption went down 9%. So stopping fossil fuels, even over 30 year period of time, is not a trivial thing in terms of impact. Stopping it even faster, which some groups are calling for, has even greater uh, implications. Can we build out renewables for those electric vehicles? Here's an interesting way to think about it. So let me walk you through this plot. Going across from the x-axis is a log scale, energy consumption in exajoules, okay, so per, per year. Vertical axis is an annualized, smooths the data out a little bit, the details don't matter. An annualized growth rate, so that many percent per year in consumption. And you see the dots for the five main sources of energy uh, that we use and have used for the last hundred years. Two important things, see 10%? As soon as you get past about 10 exajoules of consumption, nothing has ever grown at 10% per year at all. In fact, it's pretty rare for anything to grow faster than 5%, okay? If you're at smaller scale, nuclear, uh, broke the mold and actually was growing at, at prodigious rates, but it didn't last very, very long. So what would be required to replace oil, well, and all fossil fuels, but let's throw oil in there, um, by 2050 in the IEA net zero emissions pathway requires that kind of growth rate. So for the next 15 years, we need to be building wind and solar at more than 10% per year, and for much of that time, more than 15% per year, and sustain that for at least 15 years to get down into the territory where it looks like the other major systems. So getting to that 40, 60, 80 gigajoules, uh, exajoules 
you know, getting into this territory right here in 15 years from back over here has never happened before. I'm not saying it can't happen, I'm simply saying it's never happened before. $100 trillion opportunity, always ask for whom, okay? I will briefly mention, you know, just some of the reasons why a lot of people are asking that. On the left, this is data from, um, from out of the Census Bureau uh, via an NGO, but early on, before about 1980, this is U.S. data, no matter where you were in the top percentile or the bottom percentile, your income was growing about as fast as everybody else's. You see divergence in about 1980 or so. For the last 40 years, uh, the higher income groups have had their income grow a lot faster. Uh, wealth distribution, I'm trying to focus on that red bit, the bottom half. There's other various ways to show this data. This is from the St. Louis Fed. But uh, the bottom half of, this is again the U.S., but it's a similar story in other places. It's just more extreme in the U.S. Um, uh, have, been, have not been sharing in the wealth that's been generated broadly uh, in the last, this is across a 30-year uh, period. On the far right, uh, it's not as easy to build anything large scale in energy generation has impact. Okay, and if we're talking about windmills and, and solar arrays, uh, folks in the neighborhood they aren't always happy about it. What you're about to see there, I don't have the animation, but the, uh, the sun is going to be darkened for a moment when that wind turbine blade crosses the path of the sun. If your house is in that shadow, it's not a pleasant experience, basically. So there's opposition there in the middle. Uh, those are Chilean farmers concerned about water being used up uh, for lithium extraction on the bottom, a familiar street in one of the great cities of the world, uh, completely blocked with yellow vest protesters because the government was in, had imposed a price increase on diesel uh, to, to reduce CO2 emissions from the transportation sector. So an opportunity for whom is an important question to consider in this. Finally, Here's a, okay, we'll take a pause for a quiz show game. I couldn't come up with a jingle here. Do you know the status quo? Okay, I don't know if that's gonna really catch on, but, but here's the question. Go back five years, okay, 2017. Can you remember 2017? A lot has happened since then. Just how many of you knew personally somebody back in 2017 who had suffered from uh, an acute respiratory syndrome? Anybody? A couple of hands? Okay. Right now, today, how many of you know somebody who has suffered from the acute respiratory syndrome known as COVID? Okay, I didn't quite do that count, but that was about a one to two orders of magnitude change in five years. Some of you know personally. Okay. All right, so that was an interesting example. How many of you know personally someone who has been impacted by climate change right now today? No, ever. A few? Okay. A bit more than my question about the acute respiratory syndrome. Okay, so I don't know the answer to this, and neither do you, but five years from now, what do you think? Will it be a larger number of folks that you personally know that have been impacted by climate change? We will see, but you can add one to your list. That would be me. So that center picture, guess which city that is? Is it Delhi? Is it Beijing? Is it Mumbai? It is a city in North America, which historically has had some of the cleanest air in the country. Uh, Professor Song, would you agree? <laughs> Thank you. She's from Calgary. That's downtown Calgary uh, three years ago. That's wildfire smoke. So climate change is not just heat. There's other things that go with it. That was three years ago. The record was set last summer for the most days, hours of smoky, hazy skies due to wildfire. So uh, in the Western North America, this is a big problem and is going to get bigger every year. Um, 
There's two other pictures on the left and on the right. Uh, that's a highway that is not going to be usable for a while. Do I have a pointer here? I should have practiced this. See the train track up there in midair? Okay. Obviously, there used to be trestles and stuff holding up that train track, and there used to be a road right there, too. So there are one, two, three, there are four roads that you can take to get from the lower mainland of British Columbia on the west coast of Canada to anywhere else in Canada. All four of them looked like this after unprecedented amount of rainfall last November. This mattered to me because my wife and I now spend part of the year on Vancouver Island, and we managed to get back to Calgary before this happened. Had we not done that, we could not have driven our, us and our, our little dog back, back to, to Calgary. It was not possible. So direct impact is, is, is happening, and it's coming soon to, to your neighborhood. So that's to do with the shruggers. So, who's right? Everybody's right with those things in that column. Everybody's wrong with their prescriptions. If you're not plausible, yeah, I'd be thinking about a plan B for getting enough uh, wind and solar built fast enough. I had to take this from any of the many things you see in investment literature. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. And the world has changed <laughs> from a way that it has done in the past when you had a $100 trillion opportunity. Uh, and the shruggers who recognize it's not, think that's not their problem, well, soon it will be. Okay, so now you're saying, wait a minute, where's the optimism? Joanna, did you set up the t-shirts out there where the, that, that little, you've seen those things. Uh, um, I, I was told if there would be a hand basket. Uh, okay, so I didn't come here to sell you those, those t-shirts, uh, but I, let's see if there is a way out of this. Okay. The power of one word. Okay, good. What is that word? It's not as exciting a word as you might think, but at least Little Richard had a catchy version of this. You know that song, You Ain't What You Eat, It's the Way How You Chew It? It ain't what fuel you use, it's the way you combust it. Okay, some variation of that. All right. Fossil fuel energy itself is not the issue. It's the way we use it, which is to set fire to things and emit the CO2 that comes with it. Okay, so the key word here is abate, as in put an end to emissions that are a nuisance, as in to reduce the degree or intensity of emissions. And this is the key thing. Almost all the discussion, okay, not almost, all the discussion essentially assumes that oil emissions are what they are, and the only way to get rid of them is to do less stuff with oil. Now, I'm here to argue that had their sign, of, had their banner said what is said 54 times in the IEA net zero emissions pathway, it's not fossil fuels that are a problem, it's unabated fossil fuels that are the problem. So if you abate the emissions associated with them, you address the, the core issue, all right? How do you abate emissions that have to do with oil. Here's an idea. Carbon negative crude oil. I'll say that again, because that, you're thinking, wait, that's an oxymoron. Carbon negative, okay, no, no less than zero carbon. Uh, crude oil, that's all about carbon. How does this work? How can this be? Here's the way it could be, but let's start. I recognize a number of chemical petroleum engineers in here. There's an oil reservoir. Here's CO2 going into it. Forget everything else for the moment. CO2 goes in, oil gets pushed out, brine gets produced. Um, and we know this very well because this has been going on in exactly that form in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico and the Permian Basin for how many years, Larry? 50 years. We know how to do this, okay? What I propose to make different is, and so we use Let's suppose we just carry on using this oil in the same way we always have. We pipe it someplace, we refine it, we distribute fuels, we uh, burn them, okay. But what if the CO2 was not coming from a pipeline from a natural accumulation uh, uh, elsewhere on the continent, but was being pulled directly from the air? There are machines that do this. Carbon engineering is building one right now 
uh, with oxy low carbon ventures in the Permian Basin, you can do this. Okay, so if you pull the CO2 out of the atmosphere and use that to run this process, the key here is, all right, Okay, I don't know how many, I should have asked this as well. I don't know how many, I see a lot of engineers and scientists. Okay, so that dashed line is a control volume. When you talk about negative emissions, what matters is the atmosphere, not the reservoir, not anything else. It's about the atmosphere. Is the amount of carbon in the atmosphere going up or down? This is not that hard uh, uh, conception. It can be a little hard to compute. But the point here is, see, that's, I tried to draw a big fat red arrow of CO2 pulling it out of the atmosphere and a thinner green arrow for all the emissions associated with the oil. As long as more CO2 is being pulled out and going here, then the amount of CO2 going out, essentially the tailpipe of a gazillion trucks, planes, ships, cars, then this is a net negative process in the sense that CO2 is for as far as the atmosphere is concerned, the amount of CO2 associated with oil use is, is not only going down, you're actually taking care of legacy emissions, CO2 that was emitted years, decades ago. Okay? So this is a way for the oil that you use to negate its carbon impact and go beyond. Okay? How, how, how does this work? Okay, very, I'll just a brief aside. There's a whole, again, there's a whole other lecture about this, but I guess the other key point is that deep saline aquifer box on the bottom. Okay, we've got to make some space. That's what that's about. Uh, so we need to move water out as well uh, in order to store the CO2 removed from the atmosphere. Okay, so the, so the schematic looks like this. That top picture, before we start doing this, you got blue brine in the reservoir and green oil. And some of the oil gets produced and goes into the back, that box. And the key thing, this is not how standard EOR works. We're going to pull some brine out in the field. Normally, you just re-inject that in the reservoir. We're not going to do it. We're going to put it someplace else so that you have this much space for CO2. So you can, you can do the math, and, and I'll just bring you through this diagram real quick. Those red squares on the far right, that's how much carbon content, and this includes all the emissions in upstream when you're, when you're running compressors and running separations devices and all that stuff. And, all the emissions in pipelining and all the emissions in refining and all the emissions in combusting, everything, the whole life cycle. So that's up there in the 600 to 900 kind of range of kilograms per cubic meter at reservoir conditions, and CO2 is down here. So if this CO2 comes from the atmosphere, I need to put in enough to overcome that amount of carbon from the reservoir. What I want you to remember is this axis over here, smaller, simpler numbers. That's the ratio of brine that has to be pulled out, that blue box. How big does this blue box have to be compared to that green box? That's that ratio on the far right. It needs to be in this range two, three, maybe four times bigger. Okay, is that feasible? Yes, I will show you how we know that. It's a whole bunch of data there, and it's kind of a spaghetti looking thing, but look, here's oil production in reservoir conditions, note that number is 0.1. That's how much brine comes out of the ground as you're producing that much oil. For each of these curves, that's production data from reservoirs uh, in the Permian Basin. Notice the different units, so that's one. So you're routinely producing 10 times as much water as oil. Okay, that's just how these things work. So what if you were to just dispose half of that brine somewhere else and re-inject the rest. Oh dear, the little V got messed up, but okay. See that dashed line? That's a ratio of five. Remember that ratio that needed to be two, three to four to be zero, zero carbon? If I get the five, that's called a negative, that's carbon negative crude oil being produced. If I get up to eight, that's really carbon negative being produced. Just by doing that, had we run the Permian Basin for the last 40 years, with CO2 pulled from the atmosphere and disposed half of that salt water somewhere else, that would have been carbon negative crude oil the whole time. So this is feasible, that's the point here, okay? So the reservoir part is not really that hard. So there's a, there's a nice, happy, green, optimistic thing. Look, 
For the doomers, this stops unabated fossil fuel, which is what they really should be talking about. Uh, for, the, for the cheerleaders, even if we don't get EVs built fast enough and get the power generation that's green and renewable fast enough, we still have a way to mitigate emissions, okay, with, with carbon negative crude oil. More important, uh, well, also importantly, if you're looking for that $100 trillion investment opportunity, every single pathway that gets you anywhere close to net zero now requires negative emissions, okay? Some way of pulling CO2 straight out of the atmosphere. I showed you one, okay, it was a green box, but the, the, that's, that's viable, that can be done. There's a couple of other ways. So this is still something that's gonna be needed to be done, even independently of the transportation. And if you're happy driving your F-150 on gasoline, you could use carbon negative gasoline just the way you always have done because it looks, feels, tastes, just, okay, sorry, so that's wrong. It, it works just like what you've been using and have been happy with all along, okay? So even the shruggers will be able to be part of uh, the solution. So, you're, you're ready for me to end now on that happy note of optimism, yes? You remember there's a coda here. That's a technological solution to a challenge, okay? And we can debate how feasible it is and so forth. In the climate challenge, but also in other areas as well, the technology is almost the easy part. It's getting the social factors, I'll call them for the moment, aligned that really is gonna dictate what we're able to do. And that's, so there's, I, I say there's reason for some technological optimism. Is there a case for optimism for getting these things done? So there's one other word to keep in mind here. Uh, I needed one word, it's really a phrase. How do we develop socially desirable technology? It's not even socially acceptable. Acceptance kind of suggests, okay, I give in, you can do it. You want, you want iPhones. We want negative emission technologies that everybody says, yes, do more of that, in fact, right? Socially desirable technologies, developing them is not something we would normally talk about doing when we teach engineers or scientists. And it's often not what's done when, you know, the folks who develop technologies for a living. So is there a case for optimism here? I think so. I will show you five examples and we can discuss. How many of you know who Mark Carney is? Okay, okay, yep. Yeah, I thought there might be one or two. Governor of the Bank of Canada, shepherded the Bank of Canada through the Great Recession financial crisis of 2008-2009. He then moved to become the governor of the Bank of England, two major central banks, and he was governor of the Bank of, of, of England during Brexit, another massive disruption. So <laughs> either he's a glutton for punishment or he's learned some stuff that he can now put into effect. He is now one of the leaders in trying to figure out how to make finance work to usher in a net zero uh, to get us on the net zero pathway. And a key point, so his book, it's a doorstop, okay? That's just an easy way to get it up here. But go find his reef lectures for the BBC. You can also find them on the CBC in Canada. A really accessible statement. But here's the key point, and this is captured in his book. What he says is, we have allowed the market to be the arbiter of value of everything in society now. He's a central banker, he knows what he's talking about. If I were some crazy academic, you could dismiss this, but when Mark Carney says it, it carries some weight. And he says that in order to get different results from what we've had, it is in our capacity to redesign the market to reflect values, not value, return on investment, for example, but values like community, um, uh, 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 integrity and jobs and, and whatever your community, whatever you think in terms of values, okay? If, we, if the market were to capture values and not just value, that would be a way to make things happen that haven't happened in the past. Uh, if you know Rebecca Henderson, uh, 
She is faculty at both, or at various faculty both, at the MIT Sloan School of Business, at the Harvard Business School. Again, she knows what she's talking about, and she's got, since he's saying the same thing in a more focused way, how do we revamp capitalism? Her term is in a world on fire. You've heard other climate activists use that phrase. And she's saying similar things. We have to rethink how this works, how, how we set up a world uh, in order to usher this in. Um, a third point there, Kai-Fu Lee uh, was, uh, was you know, C-suite in three of the big four technology companies. He knows about, in this case, what was going on in terms of investment in artificial intelligence. The point here, his book is, well, there are other big challenges we as a civilization, as a society, are also going to be facing at the same time as climate. Machine learning is one of them, but the key, the reason I bring this up is he has some interesting things to say about how do we, how do we form a society that's stable and prosperous and happy uh, if machine learning and artificial intelligence takes away a whole lot of jobs, okay? And, it, and we have a similar, so it ties into this question of what do we value as people, not what do we value as investors? All right. Ian McGilchrist there on that fourth one um, has this interesting contention that we have built a world, it was kind of the left-brained people, and all you engineers and scientists in here are amongst them probably, um, who have wound up building a world which really favors left-brained type stuff, which favors more left-brained people getting involved. So analytics, data, um, and the right brain stuff you don't really doesn't really come into what we do as a society it's a fringe activity he's suggesting that um, we need to step back and see if we could involve uh, a broader cross-section of just our, our our mental faculties uh, each of us individually as well as a society to revamp things and finally um, if you see the the title that's braiding sweetgrass uh, Robin Wall Kim, uh, Kimmerer, um, and increasingly is becoming available and clear that as uh, indigenous peoples uh, call it, there are in fact other ways of knowing, is there a phrase. The paradigm that has brought us those curves that we talked about a few many slides ago is not the only way to organize a society, and indeed many of them have established sustainable societies over not decades, but over millennia. Okay, so, so my case for optimism is there are people who are much more knowledgeable about all of these things than me saying things in places of power, in places of influence, that we, I would say we is, okay, uh, as those of us who are engineers and scientists working on technology can integrate into this task of attempting to address what has to be done on time to get us to net zero. So with that, I hope I have done uh, Professor Schechter's memory uh, some honor by giving you something interesting to think about. Thank you very much for coming out. To, I'll be happy to discuss questions. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Brien, for giving a very interesting lecture. I really like the idea of doomers, shruggers, and cheerleaders. But when we are talking about 2050 and our challenges, net zero, I think uh, we have a lot more challenges rather than just saying climate change as a challenge, as a single challenge. It's uh, what I think it's a group of challenges because just if we look at uh, the what the electric vehicles are, they require just one electric vehicle requires 7,000 of battery that are in our phones. And it will take around, uh, we will need around 4.9 tr trillion batteries to power half of the vehicles in the world, which will take around 37 years to, uh, to manufacture. On top of that, solar energy is, uh, and wind energy is something very land intensive. 
uh, for example, solar farm requires around 450 times the land which is required for a nuclear plant, and, seven, uh, and wind, wind energy requires seven, uh, 700 times the land which is required for a gas well. And on top of that, uh, these energies are not dense. And uh, a very big challenge that I think by 2050 we are going to face is the 78 million metric tons of solar waste, of, which is because of the solar panels that we are producing right now. So how are we going to dispose that? And when we're talking about the carbon capture and storage technology, DOE uh, spent around $6.9 billion between 2004 and 2012 to, uh, uh, to work on this technology. On top of that, there was only like 4% of the plant capacity was installed uh, between 2014 and 2016. And if we, uh, right now, the total emissions in United States uh, is around 5 billion, uh, 5 billion metric tons of CO2, which will, uh, and only 1 billion metric ton of CO2 will require. Can I ask you a question? Uh, yeah. I'll turn it around, I'll ask you the question. So yeah. Are you a doomer? Or a cheerleader? I'm not sure. Uh, like, I think something in between, because there are so many challenges. I really like the environment to be clean and everything. But as engineers, we have to think about how much the economics of, the, of these technologies are and how we can improve these technologies. So what are your perspective so, on this? OK, let me answer the, the question that, yeah. that you almost asked. The answer is, and the other, uh, if I had another version, another key Absolutely important word is and. So much of the discussion looks like either or. You've got to do it my way or it ain't going to work. We need all of the above. You've, you've elucidated a lot of the reasons why it's hard, and why these, these goals are challenging, and, and I'm not disagreeing. Uh, that's why there's got to be acceptance of a breadth of solutions, and that, that turns, turns out to be a difficult thing with a lot of, a lot of the other people at the table in these, in these conversations. So I think that's the key thing is that we need to be able to meet people where they are as engineers and say, what I'm working on will help address some of it and have the humility to say, it's not the answer to everything, but it will help. We need to do a lot of things. So that's, that's what I have learned from, from the conversations I've been involved in over the last 15, 20 years now. Thanks. Yeah, uh, but, but, but my question is, how would you think like we will be able to achieve these uh, goals by 2050, considering all the challenges right now we have with all these technologies? Yeah. Had you heard of carbon negative crude oil before you came in? Yes. Oh, rats. OK, how many else have you had? <laughs> the idea is come up with new ways to think about things. I think that's, that's why and is important. We need more options. We need all the options we can come up with, because the key question is, how do you deploy resources to achieve the desired result? Okay, and optimizing that, that choice, if you've got three options, that's not very many. If you've got 30, that's better. If you've got 300, you might have a good shot at getting a, a, a path to success. Okay, so that's what I encourage your generation to do. Just keep thinking outside of the box about other ways to address things. Don't see obstacles, find opportunities. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. So can I ask you a technology question? Sure. I, I guess that's what this question is. Maybe it's a, a economic question. So I was in Midland recently and there was a lot of discussion about direct air capture. And, um, and you know there, it's actively going on, as you said. The Oxy has a big project going on, um, um, and so the. the I, but I hear a lot of skepticism about whether it's a good thing to do, and so I wonder what your perspective is. And it seems to me the issues are is there are issues, and I don't know which one are, is most important. And this is my question: Is it more important how much it costs? Is it more important how much energy it takes, which kind of is related to cost, or I mean, I, I wonder if at, at some point are we generating more carbon by removing the carbon, generating more carbon than we're removing if, if we're doing that? I guess it depends. Does all seem like uh, issues? Can you, can you explain my, or, or remedy my, abate? Can you abate my confusion? <laughs> Professor Olson, it's always been difficult to abate your confusion, but we'll try. <laughs> um, 
let me let me let me frame it like this. So, uh, with any luck, this article I'm working on is going to show up one of these days. But, but suppose as if we if we follow that IEA pathway, in um, and, and we're phasing out fossil fuels, the whole question of stranded assets arises. That's one thing. On the other hand, just to do any negative emission technology at scale will require a lot of energy input, whether it's direct air capture or bioenergy uh, with carbon capture and storage or direct you know, mineralization or, 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 okay? So there's an opportunity here to match up what would otherwise be a stranded asset with a need for a high energy consumption. We've been arguing for a while that you know, I'm not going to try to do the do the math, but but if you take so Permian Basin produces something like 20 BCF a day of gas. It's a big market for gas until there isn't. There's still a whole lot of gas. What if you were to take that gas production and run direct air capture with it, and the process that that, that carbon engineering is doing captures the CO2 from the natural gas that it uses? So there's other ways to look for synergy here. And the first two questions you asked were about cost. See above revalues. So anytime somebody says, yeah, what's it going to cost? Ask also, what will it cost if we don't do it? There's a lot of people in Midland, we all know, who just as soon keep producing gas. Now, if it's being used for something else than what it's being used for now, do they care? Uh, ask them. Let's find out. So is this about what's, what does society value? And society is not one big thing. It's one community at a time. Okay? So uh, it's, it's a tech, I almost never answer a technology question with a technology answer anymore. It's can you implement it? And uh, you know, what, what's the motivation for doing it? Because now we're talking about things where a traditional economic lens is, of course, helpful. But if that's, if that's the end of the discussion, I don't, I, my case for optimism goes, becomes much dimmer, <laughs> okay. So, so you're really saying in your slide you put up there, it's really more about the volume. Can we, can we create volume to capture all, whatever CO2 it takes to abate the CO2? If we can make enough volume in the subsurface, we can do it? Yes. Hi. Uh, so in, in your categorization of different people, I guess I would fall more on the doomer side because I think the, I guess the rhetoric there like conveys like the urgency of the issue best. Um, and I liked what you were saying about, uh, about proposing like an, sorry, I'm blanking now on, on this is like your last slide of the of a desirable like future and alternative. I guess my question is from like a social and like a political perspective, how do you sell that to people? Because I think part of the issue is just mm, a lot of the people like who have, who can, you know, I guess implement those changes or like push, I guess, push society like in that direction seem to be more on the shrugger side. Okay. So the key part of your question was, well, it was your question. How do you sell it? Right. Has anybody in here got uh, business or entrepreneurial experience? A few, yes, I thought so. Uh, uh, how do you sell something, Professor Bonacase? Put you on the spot. And a great, he says, you present a great value proposition. That's the key point is before you try to sell it, you have to make sure somebody wants it, okay? That's that social desirable piece. So the step that we hardly ever do, and we're, we've got various things that you know, we're trying to initiate, initiate at University of Calgary, Colorado School of Mines is doing something similar. You get that kind of conversation happening before you even start developing the technology, okay? So find out what people will want. So that whole innovation and entrepreneurship aspect is often missing in just straightforward technology development. Okay, so that's, that's the part I'm trying to say is 
to get people to, to be able to sell it, first make sure they want it. And to make sure they want it, they need to understand why you're doing it, what the benefits are, how they will benefit, what it means to them and their lives, where they are, and their community. Okay. So so as engineers, historically, we've done that, you know, you try to sell it to upper management and they go make it happen. That model is useful in some contexts. I would argue in this in this context, uh, it, it will not serve us well. Uh, let's see if yeah, it works with masks. Okay, um, yeah. Um, some one thing that's often mentioned uh, in this kind of context is uh, instead of what to do with the carbon. Uh, that we use because we use a lot of energy. Uh, how about if we use less? But then there's always the criticism, oh, but we don't want to uh, have, for those who are old enough, <laughs> Jimmy Carter with his um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, use less energy and suffer. Okay, without getting into American Puritanism, it's okay to suffer. Without getting there, um, Okay, I ask that question partly as a binational, um, dual national, French and, and American. And I just got back from Paris, and uh, one of the things that I uh, heard on the radio there, and I'm very bad with numbers, but I did get the nine and the 21. So it's something like um, the average French person uses nine, I don't know, per year, and the average American uses 21. So it's probably millions of something of carbon. So nine to 21. Um, but, you know, we live well over there. <laughs> so um, I'm thinking, I'm looking at this and thinking, this is a lot of space to air condition. You know, who decided to make this building this way and why? <laughs> I also just got back from Malaga because <laughs> used some carbon footprint going down to Malaga. And um, there, the, the buildings, uh, the new buildings that they're building are based on a very old notion of circulation of air, very complex, and with lots of uh, separate terraces and uh, um, imaginative, and yet partly traditional, and not expensive, and don't, they don't use a lot of energy. So is not using energy part of this? Good question. And it comes back to values again. It also comes back to and, and it comes back to abated as well. So what I didn't tell you about that uh, IEA net zero emissions pathway is included in that, getting that curve down there and not needing as much negative emissions. You know, that wasn't a big wedge on that thing. Included in that is the assumption that behavioral changes primarily will reduce overall transportation energy demand by 25% between now and 2050. So you mentioned the, the disparity between the US uh, and, and, and France. Um, so yes, behavioral change is a really interesting aspect of this, okay? And so that's part of the conversation about, about values, okay? So using less, you know, is step one in almost any consideration of environmental impact. So, so that's, that's an option, getting everybody to do it, eh, okay, maybe, maybe not. But if we do that and you know, those who are willing to suffer a bit and put on a, put on a, a sweater in the, in the White House, et cetera, um, good, okay, and many, many, many other things. So part of this is about to what extent does it make sense to continue to enable energy intensive behavior uh, and things that we had built. Um, but if you could do that in a way that did not put yet more carbon in the atmosphere, as we discussed, even reduced it, um, is there a benefit there? So, so it's a complicated, we're back to compl complication again, but, but okay, so I'll stop. But using less is part of the solution. Who uses less and how? much and all the rest of it, um, I, you know, I'm not going to prescribe to anybody, but I'm going to strongly recommend that we consider all the things that we can do because it's that big of a challenge. 
Okay, so, so thumbs up to using less and to those who need to use uh, however much they're using, like those folks with the yellow vests, uh, can we make it so that there's less impact from them doing what they do? Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you for this talk. Honestly, if it didn't have optimism in the title, I'm not sure I would have come. I'm trying to move from being a doomer into maybe more of a cheerleader. Um, so my, I have a couple of questions really quickly. Um, speaking of France, um, where do you see nuclear playing a role in the solution here? And the second part of my question is, in terms of the life cycle of direct air capture technologies, materials, how much it, energy it takes to produce, how, what is the timeline do you think for enacting the, enabling the technology that you mentioned of uh, net negative um, oil production? Okay. So first question, role of nuclear. I will stay true to my, what I said earlier, and you know, I am fine right, with that because it, it will help. So what we see is that you know, if people have preferred solutions and by expressing that pre preference to say, and that can't be part of the solution. Okay, now I've got to run this race with an arm behind my back. We take CCS off the table, and now I've got to do this, and we take carbon negative crude, okay, I'm gonna run out of, of, of metaphor here, but, but you get the idea, okay? So I am a fan of not taking anything off the table. Um, if it looks like there's, uh, re that it will work, and there's societal desirability is apparent. If most people don't want it, that's an important signal. Okay. Um, second question. One of the reasons that, that I and my colleagues at UFC, University of Calgary, have been uh, quite interested in, in that carbon negative crude oil is it's scalable. Okay, we haven't built out the direct air capture at scale yet, but carbon engineering is doing it right now. Okay, so. And they deliberately set out as a corporate objective to do something that was relatively straightforward and ain't that fancy, okay? Which is the whole point. If you look at the other options, scalability is a key challenge. We need more options, okay? So that was one that we are wanting people to talk about because as I say, oil is usually said, okay, only way to deal with oil is use less of it, less and less and less and less. So if we can get, address the oil problem uh, in terms of emissions, as well as the need for other options for negative emissions, that's a potentially a good thing that we could demonstrate at scale much faster than the other things that are out there. You kind of answered my question a little bit there at the end, Steve, but Mike, the, the thing with these net zero things, I've heard that the, to get net zero by 2050, you have to have zero investments in fossil fuel production, transportation, and everything else than that one of your legs basically that you're in your, your running analogy. Um, but, but you don't agree with that basically is from what I'm, what I'm understanding here. No, I agree with that, but you need to have the whole sentence. What the IEA, which is where a lot of this came from says is no investment in unabated fossil energy. That's a difference. Okay. It's a subtlety. That's why I said there's the power of one word. <laughs> You put that word unabated into that statement, it's a very different picture, all right? So yeah, investing in coal-fired power without, uh, without capture um, is signing up to make the problem even harder, okay? But, so that's, you get the idea, right? So that's, that's the, the issue there is if we can make sure the discussion is clear on whether we're talking about abated or unabated, then it gives us more options, basically, and that are still consistent with the goal of uh, getting to net zero. Howdy, Steve. Thanks again. Yeah, great talk. So um, for the books you summarized there or any other books you've read that are related to economists or sort of technology-oriented people, maybe not necessarily in the energy industry, do you think they understand the physical basis and the role of energy in the economy? And did they talk about that in any way that you thought made any sense? Uh, second question, you never talked about what you're gonna do with all the brine. Okay. Um, so your, your first question, uh, that's a good one, Kerry. I, I'm not well versed enough to know what the economists would find uh, 
as also a good explanation of how energy fits in. Having said that, uh, what I'm starting to hear, so because of ESG, environmental, social, and governance, which is now a key metric for any corporation in the world, um, there are increasingly in-house smart people who understand how energy, the role of energy in those ESG uh, metrics. Okay, so so I, so they're learning fast. And so I've worked with some folks. You know, the, there's there's five big banks in Canada, and you know we've we've had conversations with three of them, and all of them are it's quite impressive with with you know their grasp of the situation. Um, and given this is Canada, and the large investment needed to sustain oil production in Western Canada, it's a very timely timely issue. Uh, what do you do with the brine? Okay, so. Uh, Where's John? Okay. When you, your last trip to Midland, uh, did you get out of town at any distance? All right. Did you see how many trucks, not pickups, but how many trucks hauling stuff did you see? <laughs> lots? Oh, lots, yeah. And what were they hauling, Professor Olson? Oh, I salt water. I a, let's say salt water, yeah. It was. They're all there's heading, 10 times as much as oil. They're right? all heading to salt water disposal wells. So the simplest thing to do because most of that is frac fluid coming back. Uh, but you know, with produced brine, what's the easiest thing to do when you're developing a field 40 years ago? Hell, strip the oil out and re-inject it. Get rid of it. I don't care. Just you know, help push oil out, right? Good idea. Done. So the infrastructure is not necessarily there immediately, but it ain't that difficult to, you don't have to put it in a truck and ship it off. You can drill your own disposal well. So, so wastewater disposal is, you know, is an industry uh, in North America. But more interestingly is, and this, you know, this has been an idea for a while that is starting to get some traction. Uh, well, we haven't talked about, but one of the reasons for the wildfires is how much drier, uh, especially Western North America, is getting. And that's going to start affecting agriculture, the thing I heard whenever it was three days ago, uh, a lot sooner than you think. See above, we, we the shruggers. So there may actually make sense to start desalinating some of that and using it for, for other purposes. But the simplest thing to do to get things going is to simply do deep saline brine uh, uh, disposal. It's a standard process, safe, effective, it adds some cost. So if you take it out of reservoir A, yep. but you don't want to put it back into reservoir A, so you go find reservoir B. Why didn't you just find reservoir B for the CO2 to begin with? Two is how much oil you push just out of reservoir B. All right, so, so yeah, you, you can't play this musical chairs game forever. <laughs> At some point, <laughs> you've got to park the water somewhere else to make enough space. Because, yeah, in practice, you may well use water in another project nearby if there's a good operational reason to do it. So, so yeah, this was just to show feasibility, but it raises a great question. Now you've got a big water flow going on. Okay, are there other things you could do with it besides simply dispose it? So, so it opens up other ways to think about it, from whether you mine geothermal energy out of it or, or any of the other things that people are talking about. Oops. Professor Ballenhoff, we've worn everybody out. All right, well, uh, I just want to give Steve Ryan a hand.